We live in uncertain and challenging times. So much is happening so fast, it seems impossible to make sense of it all. We're clearly on some kind of trajectory, but a trajectory toward what? We all use different lenses to look at the world, like religious beliefs and political ideologies. But for now, let's look at the last century through three common lenses and see what each tells us about where we came from and where we're headed. It's evident, for example, that over the past century, the economy has grown, and many of us pay particular attention to that. Per capita incomes have increased. We've seen the introduction of all kinds of new technologies, from telephones and typewriters to lasers, cell phones, and iPads. We've become a mobile and global society. Modern medicine has discovered cures or treatments for a host of ailments, and all of this has helped support population growth. We now enjoy the company of seven billion other humans. Let's represent the trajectory of all this economic growth with this blue line. Others of us, however, when looking back at the last century, emphasize our social achievements. Today, more nations are democracies. Far more people have access to information and education. A century ago, women didn't have the right to vote, and in large areas of the United States, African Americans endured vicious discrimination and maltreatment, even from our own government. All of that has changed, thanks to considerable effort and struggle. It's hard to measure these accomplishments the way we measure, say, GDP. But let's represent that trajectory with this green line. Still, others of us think of the modern era in terms of what the environment has suffered. Species are going extinct at more than a thousand times the normal rate. Oceans are acidifying. Topsoil is disappearing. Many nations are experiencing water scarcity. Chemicals are altering the building blocks of life. Extreme weather events are threatening our food supply. Our oceans now feature huge dead zones, and great gyres of plastic fragments, and the impacts of these make their way up the food chain. Again, it's hard to put that on an X and a Y axis, but we're just looking at basic directional trends, so we can represent the increase in environmental damage with this red line. These are the three great trends of our time and people who pay attention primarily to one or another of them are, well, they're right. They're all right. All of this has been going on concurrently. It's the best of times and the worst of times. But these three trends are at least partly explained by a fourth, energy use. It takes energy to do things, and throughout the human past, the amount of energy available to us was limited. Until very recent times, we got most of our energy directly or indirectly from food crops and trees and used it as muscle power. When we began using fossil fuels at the start of the Industrial Revolution, we claimed history's biggest energy prize, cheap, abundant fossil energy enabled us to grow the size of our economy many times over. Having all this energy led to rising social aspirations, and fuel-fed machines gave us the free time to follow our dreams. Oil was arguably the most important of these fuels. It's perfect for transportation. We developed trains, automobiles, airplanes, and oil-burning ships, and these in turn enabled global trade to grow exponentially. We became more mobile, and that called forth a yearning for other kinds of freedom. But burning all those fossil fuels, increasing our consumption of resources, and growing our population led to unprecedented environmental destruction. In this case, it is easy to be quantitative. We could show our expanding energy use with graphs of BTUs, or megajoules expended by humanity annually, or barrels of oil. 
or tons of coal consumed. But once again, we'll just sum up the general trend. This black line will do the trick. If energy is a key to understanding the past, it is also a key to interpreting the economic, social, and environmental future. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Enough graphs. Let's make this personal. I'd like to share with you a little about my family and how the last hundred years and these trends shaped the lives of some of the people closest to me. My great-grandmother, Della, moved to San Francisco from Eastern Europe at the turn of the 20th century. Six days a week, she would take a trolley, just like the one shown here, to work as a seamstress so that my grandmother and her brothers could have a better life. By the way, this film was shot just four days before the great earthquake in 1906. The earthquake and subsequent fire destroyed the building where they lived, but my great-grandfather turned disaster into opportunity. Two years after the earthquake, in 1908, he opened his first neighborhood grocery store. That same year, Henry Ford introduced the Model T, the first affordable, mass-produced automobile. Life was slower then. America was still primarily a rural place, and travel was mostly by horse, bicycle, or on foot. The U.S. had a budget of 659 million. Our population was 89 million, and most of those people were farmers. About half of the horsepower in the economy was still being supplied by, well, horses. By muscles, that is, as opposed to engines. Firewood was still an important fuel, but coal and oil were coming along fast. The world's biggest corporation at that time was Standard Oil. American petroleum from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and California was fueling the beginnings of the auto and aircraft industries. My father Clarence was born in 1925, and from day one was a daredevil. The story of his wild ride down Filbert Street on his Paris coaster is still a family legend. It's a good thing there were a lot fewer cars on the road in those days, or else I might not be here. One of his favorite childhood memories was taking that same trolley down Market Street to the Embarcadero in order to hop the ferry across the bay to Neptune Beach, an amusement park that had a great roller coaster ride, a gigantic pool, and all kinds of games. But the fun wouldn't last. When my dad was five years old, in 1930, the U.S. was still in the early stages of the Great Depression. The U.S. federal budget amounted to about $3.3 billion, and America's population stood at 123 million. By this time, automobiles were commonplace, and oil had become the most important source of energy in the national economy. The United States was now the center of the global oil industry, producing half or more of the world total and exporting large amounts to other countries. But something happened that year. The annual amounts of oil discovered in the U.S. peaked. Every year since 1930, we've found less oil within our borders than we did then, and the downward trend is undeniable when you look at data from the last eight decades. I was born in January 1945, on the day that Allied forces liberated the infamous Nazi death camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The war in Europe was still in full swing, but the Germans were retreating and would surrender just a few months later. In the Pacific theater, of course, the war was raging and the Bay Area had by far the most military bases of any city in the country. Three of my uncles served in the Army, and both my aunts were among the Rosie the Riveter crews who built the ships that won the war. The end of the war ushered in an era of unprecedented growth in the American middle class. My family was no exception. We moved to the suburbs, had two cars, two kids, two dogs, and a TV.
In the summers, we'd pile into the Chevy and drive out to Reno. By the way, since this photo was taken in 1956, we've used 90% of all the oil that's ever been consumed. That year, more U.S. workers held white-collar jobs than blue-collar. The U.S. population was close to 169 million, and the federal budget topped $70 billion. By this time, industrial agriculture had made it possible to dramatically increase food production. Millions of small farmers went under, and by 1956, only 5% of Americans were still farming. The Cold War was in full swing, and the military budget had grown to 60% of all government spending. In this year, a respected geophysicist named Marion King Hubbard noted that U.S. petroleum discoveries had been declining for a quarter of a century. He forecast that our nation's oil production would peak soon, probably around 1970. He was ridiculed. It's best if we just skip over the 60s. I can't really remember them well anyway. But by the early 70s, I found myself actually having settled down with a family, a house, and a steady job. In 1973, hourly wages for American workers were at their highest point ever if you adjust for inflation. The first Earth Day had occurred a couple of years earlier, and the environmental movement was starting to take off. The Vietnam War was continuing unabated. The U.S. population stood at 212 million. U.S. oil production had indeed peaked in 1970, just as M. King Hubbard had forecast, though very few people realized it yet. They would. In 1973, everybody came to understand that America had become economically vulnerable because of our dependence on foreign oil. An oil embargo by the Arab members of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, drove oil prices into the stratosphere. The American economy took a major hit, and after the 1970s, economic growth in the wealthy industrial nations would never be quite the same, moving away from manufacturing and exporting to an increasingly service-based economy. In the 1980s, like so many other people my age, I was putting in longer hours, but wasn't sure I was getting ahead. While my kids were obsessed with zippered jackets, moonwalking, and flying DeLoreans powered by garbage, I was spending two hours a day stuck in traffic. The only saving grace was that gas prices got cheap again. In 1986, America's federal budget amounted to nearly $1 trillion. By this time, our population had just topped 240 million. And though we didn't know it, the Soviet empire was on the verge of collapse. The Soviets were major oil producers. And when oil prices plummeted in the late 1980s, thanks to a short-lived production boom in the North Sea and Alaska, the Soviet economy faltered. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989, which just about everyone today agrees was a good thing. But low oil prices during this era dramatically slowed efforts to develop solar and wind energy, efforts that started in the 1970s when oil prices were so high. With oil now cheap again, Americans went back to big cars and easy motoring. Globalization really took off. The U.S. economy began to depend ever more on outsourcing, offshoring, and finance rather than manufacturing, thanks to computers, container ships, and satellite communication. Okay, let's fast forward to today. I'm one of the lucky ones. I've got four beautiful grandkids, my health is good, and my mortgage is paid off. But I know that's not the case for so many others out there. Honestly, I worry about my kids and grandkids. 
My daughter recently lost her job and is having a hell of a time finding a new one. My son is working his tail off, and though he doesn't like to talk about it, I can tell he's worried. We should all be worried. Farmers are just 2% of the population, and their average age is pushing 60. The federal budget is nearly $4 trillion, and we've accumulated $15 trillion of national debt and counting. The U.S. population stands at more than $300 million. Even though we've talked about our dependence on foreign oil for 40 years, we've done little to reduce it. We still import most of our petroleum. But world oil production has essentially flatlined since 2005. In 2008, the global economy was thrown into turmoil, in part because of record high oil prices. In 2011, Political unrest in the Middle East and North Africa again drove oil prices upward. And an earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear nightmare in Japan left massive devastation in its wake and tore at the world economy, making us realize that still another of our main energy sources has big problems. Given that energy has been so crucial to so many of our human achievements during the past century or two, looming energy limits would seem to pose serious problems for us. You'd think we'd be responding with more urgency, but we're not. This is partly because we're getting mixed messages. Fossil fuel companies rightly point out that there are still enormous amounts of energy resources in the ground. What they fail to mention is that these sources are of a much lower grade and harder to get. And using these less efficient energy sources will cost much more than we're accustomed to paying. It's not just the price at the pump. Higher energy prices create a drag on the entire economy. And the environmental risks will be far greater, as the Gulf oil spill taught us. The low-hanging fruit is gone. Unfortunately, switching to alternative energy sources won't be as easy as we'd hoped. Post Carbon Institute looked at alternative energy sources very carefully in a study a couple of years ago. They examined 18 energy sources using 10 criteria, including cost, bang for the buck, environmental impacts, ease of use, and so on. The most important and least understood of these is net energy the amount of energy returned for the energy invested. In the early days of oil, we got 100 barrels of oil out of the ground for every barrel of oil we used to get them. These days, lower-grade fossil fuels and renewables get far lower energy returned for energy invested, or EROEI. The Post Carbon Institute arrived at a sobering conclusion. None of these sources will enable us to maintain our current level of energy use. We're headed for a lower energy future, and that future could arrive quite soon. Why? The alternative energy sources just aren't up to the challenge at this point, and the amount of investment capital that would be needed to get them up to capacity simply isn't there. Many renewable energy sources, including wind and solar, are viable and should be prioritized. The problem is, what they are replacing, conventional fossil fuels, are concentrated and portable, and were created by nature over tens of millions of years without any human effort. We can have a renewable energy economy. In fact, it's inevitable but it simply won't function or look like the economy we're familiar with. It may be smaller, slower, and more localized. And that transition could be coming quite soon. So where do we go from here? What are our choices? Where are the opportunities? What does this mean for our children, our grandchildren? In a sense, we've been borrowing from them or stealing. Our continued burning of non-renewable resources like oil and coal means there will be less available to future generations.
they might have thought of something more valuable to do with these amazing substances than just burn them up, but they won't have the chance to do so. Most of the high-quality, easily accessed oil, coal, and gas is already gone. In addition to our legacy of fossil fuel depletion, we're leaving future generations with major environmental issues. By mid-century, many nations will be suffering from water scarcity, and many thousands of animals and plants will have gone extinct. The folks who mostly pay attention to that first blue curve, the economic curve, typically argue that a fast-paced, growing global economy is our most valuable legacy to future generations, since only innovation and investment can solve our environmental problems. But they assume we'll always find another energy source to keep the economy growing. Things don't appear to be working out that way. And if growth stops, a lot of bills will come due at once, on top of our already unsustainable levels of debt. We're piling on vast sums in debt, securities, and derivatives. The numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But those numbers ultimately stand for real things, food, minerals, and energy. And many of those things aren't growing. They're finite. We're depleting nature's storehouse of natural resources at an accelerating pace. If you look at it that way, economic growth looks an awful lot like a Ponzi scheme. And in Ponzi schemes, a few people get rich early on, but most people lose out in the end. It's true that our economic progress has been associated with real social benefits. Most of us want it all, the cars, air conditioners, and smartphones, as well as political freedoms and access to information. But all of it may be at risk if we can't keep the economy growing with more cheap energy. So here's a crucial question. Can we disengage energy consumption from the benefits we want? Up to a point, yes. We can make our energy consumption more efficient. But if population keeps growing, especially if everyone in the world wants the same creature comforts we now enjoy, we'll cancel out much of the payoff from improved efficiency. To be sure, energy efficiency is a very good thing. It's one of the most important strategies we have. But we can't expect efficiency to drive the same level of economic growth as cheap, abundant energy. It may be easier to keep all of our social achievements than all of our economic benefits. But that may not be such a terrible trade-off. It can be argued that, in the economic sphere, we've actually overdone it. We've come to think of overconsumption as normal, as a source of status and identity, but we could scale back a bit on material consumption without much real distress, and everyone could count on some basic level of support if we replaced consumerism with other, more enduring values. We don't have to give up our political freedoms, our access to information, or social progress, and we shouldn't have to. None of those things really requires enormous amounts of energy or other natural resources. However, material consumption does. And if we don't scale back, the energy transition might be messy and painful. We've created financial structures that only function properly under conditions of constant economic growth. And we have few provisions in place to keep people from economic ruin if the financial system really goes out of control, as it started to do in 2008. So how can we disconnect energy consumption from social and essential economic benefits? Can we focus more attention on strategies like low-input agriculture, alternative transportation, and renewable energy? None of these is a silver bullet but all deserve support and attention. Maybe we can still aspire to improve the human condition 
and the lives of our children if we focus less on quantity and more on quality, less on whatever is bigger and faster, and more on what is sustainable and equitable. As we make our way through the closing years and decades of the fossil fuel era, I believe we can enjoy benefits as we face these challenges by paying more attention to quality of life, a sense of community, and self-reliance. As recent studies have shown, there is little correlation between levels of happiness in a society and the amount of energy consumed. We still face enormous challenges in moving beyond fossil fuels. We're talking about a redesign of most of the basic systems that support modern civilization. The details are going to take a lot of work. What does finance look like in a post-fossil fuel, post-growth world? What about global trade? What political stresses and strains will emerge when economic expectations are downsized? What kinds of social messages will help people adapt? In order to make this shift, we will need to focus on a few central priorities. Relocalize. Without cheap transport fuel, the trend toward globalized production and distribution that we've seen in recent decades will begin to reverse. Nations and communities that depend on long-distance supply chains will face problems, while those that produce much of what is needed close by will gain the advantage. Reskill. As the trend toward mechanization slows and reverses due to rising costs of energy and materials, we will need to know how to do more for ourselves, including growing more of our own food and taking better care of our health through nutrition and exercise, depending less on expensive pharmaceuticals. We'll need to know how to live in a world where cheap stuff isn't constantly shipped here from China. Conserve. Making the most of available energy and materials will become an art. Solar cookers, solar food dryers, solar water heaters, and even good old-fashioned clotheslines will help us do more with less. Share. Does each of us need a complete set of tools, gadgets, and machines for every imaginable contingency? By pooling resources among neighbors and families, we can reduce consumption levels while enriching our social lives. Build resilience. Even if we do everything right, we're going to hit some economic and environmental obstacles along the way. We need to make sure we can bounce back. Food and energy systems are more resilient if they have built-in redundancies and are distributed rather than centralized. By living more locally, living more healthily, taking care of our environment, improving our culture, and building stronger relationships, we could realistically aspire to build a more contented, more engaged society in the long run. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I know it's important to frame the right questions. And the single biggest one I know is this. How can we create the best possible life for all in a world with less energy? It's going to take a lot of us approaching this problem from different angles to figure it out. And the solutions will come down to more than graphs and numbers. In the end, this is about people, the people we care most about. This is the challenge of our lifetime. Let's embrace it and see what we can do together.